Coming up, Drexel and the Academy of Natural Sciences unite. A behind the scenes look on this special edition of D News. Hello, I'm Maria Papadakis and welcome to D News. I'm at the renowned Dinosaur Hall at the newly minted Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University. It's a groundbreaking and exciting affiliation for two of Philadelphia's most respected research institutions. The partnership between Drexel and the Academy promises to be a huge plus for both, promoting discovery, learning, and engagement in the natural and environmental sciences. You know, this is an institution with a 200-year history in the heart of Philadelphia that many people don't know about. And I think part of what Drexel can do now is help lift the academy to a greater level of prominence and access so that more people take advantage of it. It's a place full of treasures, uh, full of stories, uh, full of uh, wonderful history. Um, and also it's a place about the future. Down here, the best way to look at it is this will ultimately become a campus for the university with, uh, here's another great example, uh, museum studies through the Westfall School. Here we have the learning lab for that, right? We have a museum right on the parkway. But our collections are here, our labs are here for environmental science. So we envision seeing this area, the academy, becoming really very much part of the university with students going back and forth. And the two organizations are building a brand new department called BEES, which stands for Biodiversity, Earth, and Environmental Sciences. There are approximately 13 staff members here at the Academy who will be teaching and integrated within the BEES department. 101 is sort of an introduction to environmental science. It's to get the kids, the new kids that come into school, out in the field together to see how environmental science works um, as in a field experiential type of approach. Bees 102 is to bring the new students over here to the academy to explore our collections and to understand how systematic biology um, and evolutionary processes work um, and how we study those here. Our motto goes field experience early and often. The idea is to get the new students who come in and make them feel as a cohort uh, within this new department. In the meantime, the Academy remains one of the city's rare gems, attracting people of all ages. Oh, I see that. It's not moving. Because it's not real. Oh. Where else can kids ooh and ah at these lifelike dioramas or pretend to go on an archaeological dig? and everyone gets a chance to experience the time when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. And then there's this incredible butterfly exhibit. Which uh, basically gives anybody the chance to walk into a small tropical rainforest where you can see all stages of a butterfly's life. And more than that, just standing in this area you can have a butterfly light on your shoulder or on your hand, and so you get to see the beauty of these beautiful creatures up close and when they're very still, and many of them in the wild you never have a chance to see because they're very secretive and furtive. So that's always very popular, especially in the winter, where you walk in there and, and the humidity's up and the temperature's comfortable and you feel like you're in the tropics. So even in the dead of winter, there are birds, bees, probably even educated fleas. We are a library of life. We have a world-renowned collection, depending on the subject matter, whether it's shells or birds or fish. Not only might it be number one, two, or three, or certainly top five in the country and in the world, but scientists come from all over the world to study specific subject matter. And then we have the library. Again, we have volumes in our library that date back to the 1500s. And so it's a unique uh, prize of ours that is coveted by researchers all over the world. 
And there are always a ton of special events. We will have a year-long environmental science symposium program where we will be discussing topics such as uh, slow food, water, global warming, et cetera, et cetera, that will be right here in our auditorium. There will also be a scientific symposium that will be both here and on the Drexel campus. I believe that's in late 2012. And of course, there will be birthday parties and celebrations along the way because we need to celebrate the fact that this place has been around and we're an important part not only of natural history in the country, but in the future of natural history with Drexel University. The Academy is celebrating its 200th birthday, and it has an incredibly rich and colorful history, including unique contributions from world-renowned authors, adventurers, and even presidents. We are the oldest natural history museum in the country. 1812, so predating the American in New York or the Smithsonian in DC. In 1812, Philadelphia naturalists John Speakman and Jacob Gilliams formed a society of their colleagues to cultivate the natural sciences. They established a library and museum in a rented house on 2nd Street. This museum was founded by American scientists who thought that we had enough of the body of knowledge as well as new specimens of flora and fauna that we should determine how to name them versus sending them to London to the Royal Society to, uh, to have them pass judgment. Through the years, the Academy has had many homes, including Broad and Sansom Streets and many distinguished members and contributors. In our collections, we have Thomas Jefferson's fossil collection of mastodon bones and woolly mammoth bones found in what is now Kentucky. We have birds that were Audubon's birds. Now, I don't mean painted birds. I mean birds that Audubon harvested and used for his studies, and they include currently extinct species, such as the Carolina parakeet. We have Lewis and Clark's herbarium. All the plant material that they returned with from their exhibition is in our collections. Ernest Hemingway, famous author, was a collector for the Academy. Ernest Hemingway was a great fisherman, so needless to say, he added to our ichthyology collection. In 1876, the museum moved to its current location at 19th and Race. Architect James H. Windrum designed the building. Windrum also created the Falls Bridge and the Philadelphia Masonic Temple on North Broad Street. I think you would describe the architecture originally as what was called University Gothic. I can't really see it as much now, but nonetheless, uh, we were the first presenting institution on the parkway. Now approaching its 200th year, the Venerable Museum generates enormous loyalty and respect drawing visitors and scientists from around the world. Because you're only as good as your relevance that you show today and tomorrow. Today's Academy houses some of the most fascinating scientists and research collections in the world. Dean News reporter Courtney Thomas went behind the scenes for a look at the Academy that few get to see. I feel more at home in the most remote desert than I do in, in some big cities. Meet Ken Lacavera. While most kids were growing up trading baseball cards, he was looking at rocks. For almost all of us, it's what we wanted to do when we were little kids. You know, I remember in second grade writing an essay on igneous metamorphic and sedimentary rocks and why sedimentary rocks were the best, which is because you can find fossils in them. And so at the end of the day, excavating in a quarry, you sit back and you watch the sunset and you see these bones of a creature that no one knew existed, you know, something that no one in history has known before. And it's, um, it's very satisfying. It's much more satisfying than um, returning emails. Lacavera, a modern-day Indiana Jones, is an associate professor of biology at Drexel and collaborates with staff at the Academy's Fossil Prep Lab. We bring dinosaur fossils here from Patagonia, from Egypt, from China, from the U.S. West. And um, 
Drexel students come here and they're trained in fossil preparation and how to study fossils. We have graduate students here, we have undergraduates, we have volunteers from the community. We have, you know, stay-at-home dad, an engineer, a jockey, retirees. Um, and we have students that have taken um, semesters off from other universities, UCLA and universities in, in, in Britain and all over the place to come here just to be part of this Patagonia dinosaur project. That project made headlines with a mammoth discovery in Patagonia seven years ago. Lacavera's team unearthed remains of the second largest dinosaur ever to be found. This dinosaur that we brought back from Patagonia in life would have weighed about 60 tons. It would have been about 120 feet long and would have been about two and a, two and a half stories tall. Um, the femur, the thigh bone of this animal is uh, seven feet one inches tall. The ribs go for tens of feet. A single toe bone after it's fossilized weighs about 50 pounds and is the size of a basketball. So this is just a, a creature of unbelievable proportions. It's, it's very hard for us to wrap our minds around it, even though we've been working with it for five years. Even though he doesn't have to worry about running into a live dinosaur while plying his trade in remote parts of the world, Lacavera says he isn't exactly sitting at a desk. So, you know, I've had some encounters with venomous animals, with uh, snakes and scorpions, like everybody that works in the field has. It's not really unusual. And so, you know, animals are fairly predictable. The elements are fairly predictable, and you can, you can, you know, you can calculate your risk when you go outside. Human beings, not as predictable. In Egypt, a man um, rode at me very fast on a donkey with a scimitar because he thought that I was a grave robber. And then once he found out that I was a paleontologist, he was, you know, very cordial and, uh, and uh, neighborly. But he says, risks and discomforts aside, he and his troops remain loyal and committed. When I go down to Patagonia, I usually take a crew of about 10 people uh, with us. We're in the field for two months. It's pretty hard field season. We're about 100 miles off the grid. Um, we go out for two weeks at a time. Every two weeks we come back into town for a night or two for showers and provisions. And so it's not for the faint of heart. Um, I take graduate students there. I've taken a uh, Drexel undergraduate there who did fabulous. And I, I brought her back the next year and she became one of the leaders really of the team that year. And um, I've never had a Drexel student kind of blow up on me in the field as you know you could in a very, if you've ever seen you know, shows like Survivor, you know, some people melt down in the wilderness. Never had a problem with one of the students. They've never complained about the harshness of the conditions. They've never wanted to go home early. In fact, they're usually scheming at the end of the expedition on ways that they can stay out in the field longer. Let me show you. So we'll carefully store everything so it stays in good shape. This is 380 million years old from the Devonian rocks up in the Canadian Arctic. Ted Deschler's work in tracing the evolution of fish from finned to limbed is respected worldwide. You can usually find him climbing rocks or splashing in the water. I do a lot of fossil collecting, exploration to new areas. Uh, two places in particular. One is up in north central Pennsylvania. So when you're driving down the highways and you see those red strata of the rocks up there and you see somebody climbing on them, that might be me. Uh, but also we go way up to the Canadian Arctic where there's also Devonian age strata. These are rocks that are about 380 million years old. And um, we've gotten very good luck uh, and I've sort of become a specialist in studying fishes, ancient fishes, unlike anything that's really alive today, and especially those fishes that were developing fins and the bones inside of their fins that would allow them eventually to come onto land. So we're looking at that transition between finned animals and limbed animals. One of Deschler's most important and recent discoveries was an ancient fossil found in Canada. He used an Arctic language to name it. And we named a fossil Tiktaalik. And Tiktaalik means large freshwater fish. And when we found it and analyzed this fossil it's from the Devonian period, we realized that we had the best transitional form between finned animals and limbed animals. It's a textbook example of that evolutionary change. And so that's probably been the, the most exciting thing that I've found. And that fossil is here at the Academy of Natural Sciences? That fossil is here, um, and parts of it are on display, uh, cast of it or recreation of it are all on display here. 
Like every one of the scientists we spoke with here, Deschler is happy about the Academy Drexel connection. And we see the affiliation with Drexel uh, being a, an avenue by which we can attract all those excited, excited young scientists, you know, sharp minds, great new ideas. Um, so just having that as part of the sort of critical mass of, of scientists here at the Academy is really exciting. Oh, and there's more. Drexel students will soon be able to access the incredible resources here and learn how to pave their own paths in science directly from the pros themselves. Here's more from Courtney Thomas. This was taken in the 1880s, and it's, uh, it's as good as the day they found it. Paul Calamon loves his mollusks. They're all, they're all my children, but if I had to point to the ones that I like at the moment, it's these giant clams. Um, we're gradually becoming surrounded by them here in the lobby. They are very, very cool animals indeed. Calamon is a collections manager at the Academy's Malacology Department, which houses a fascinating array of creatures from under the sea. Compared with the ocean floor, the Amazon basin is a desert. For the sheer number of species and the sheer variety of lifestyles, the lengths of histories, the divergence and the variations, you can't beat the shallow to middle depth seas. Of course, when you get deeper, you come across little darlings like this, the pill bug from hell. This is a, an isopod, lives about a thousand meters down. And what's cool about the isopods is they never know where the next meal's coming from. So when they find something to eat, they keep eating. And their body plates actually are held together with elastic ligaments and can disarticulate. This thing can eat itself to the size of a basketball because who knows when it'll ever get a meal again. Okay, they're freaky and they're spooky, but not altogether kooky. The work here can lead to important scientific breakthroughs. As part of a funded project that we are doing in the Philippines at the moment, we're looking into the venoms that are produced by this group of mollusks called the cone shells. These are all venomous predators. They tend to eat fish or other mollusks or worms. They stab their prey with harpoons that are loaded with poison. There have been 21 known human fatalities from this species alone. They are the most venomous animals on Earth. But their venoms are very interesting in the way they work. And the study group that we're working with in Utah, at the University of Utah, have now managed to isolate compounds from those venoms that are operating as the first viable alternative to morphine for the treatment of chronic pain. It's now been patented, it's now on the market. It's the first major drug development from this research project, but there are a lot more to come. And then again, this department features the just plain fascinating, including this above ground story with a Philly connection. There is a, uh, a single beautiful, probably seven feet long worm extracted from a human intestine by the immortal Joseph Lydie, who worked at the academy. He was a surgeon at the uh, Penn Hospital at the time, so he had free run of basically that's people's the, the intestinal tracts. Right? Exactly, the last man who knew everything. And we have his specimens. So there you are. These are basically time capsules of data. So you can get all kinds of different data from these morphology, ecological uh, data. Ned Gilmore is surrounded by weird and fascinating things in jars. He gets to see specimens most of us never dreamed about. Here's a small sampling. This is a, a selection of our group of rats which were collected in Italy um, probably in around the 1830s, but they were collected by Napoleon Bonaparte's nephew, Charles Bonaparte, who was a naturalist and good friends of the Academy. And this is a Bushmaster snake, largest venomous snake in South America. In this jar are two eyeballs from a raw seal. It's not the whole body of a, a, panda, a koala, it's, it's just its head. And uh, he's sort of sad sitting in the jar there. But Ned saved the best for last. This large Indian fruit bat, uh, this once lived uh, as a zoological specimen at the Philippi Zoo back in 1899 and uh, it died and uh, it was preserved and, and saved here uh, for a, a, a specimen for study. 
To demonstrate to our crew the size of this creature, and to prove I'm not a wuss, I got to remove the bat and stretch it out. Yow. And then what you want to do is grab the back part's wing there and really? the outside wing there. And it's really stretched nice. out. Oh, wow. Oh, he's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> so, All right. If you want to just put him down and just give him a nice big hug, squeeze him in, and then plop him back in. Ned says, don't be fooled by the weirdness. This collection has value to science. Wow. So cool. <laughs> Just don't let that snake out of the jar, okay? Jason Weintraub is wild about walking sticks, moss, and mosquitoes. But his favorite creepy crawler is clearly the beetle. Without a doubt, they are the most successful group of animals. There are more different kinds of beetles on Earth than any other group of living things. We've only described about 400,000 beetle species in terms of formally naming them, and uh, the general consensus is that that's the tip of the iceberg. There may be 8 to 10 million different beetle species. Beetles may be the most plentiful insect, but Weintraub considers the tiny mosquito the most threatening. They're certainly um, the most uh, important group of insects in terms of, of human health and well-being, and the entire field of medical entomology uh, involves a lot of focus on mosquitoes as vectors of, of major diseases like malaria and yellow fever and dengue fever and more recently uh, West Nile virus. Uh, this particular case includes in this tray here Aedes aegypti, uh, the vector of yellow fever, which uh, has been a particularly devastating illness here in the Philadelphia area in historical times. Uh, in the 1790s, uh, there were a series of epidemics, the worst in 1793, which wiped out a large fraction of Philadelphia's population at the time. Nearly 5,000 people died in one summer. And of course, at that time, they didn't understand that mosquitoes were transmitting this viral uh, pathogen. They did know that if you stayed in the low wet areas between the Schuylkill and Delaware rivers that you weren't going to live, and they literally evacuated the federal government of the United States. The Academy houses a collection of insects that fascinates and educates. Weintraub will often box up a batch of bugs and ship it out for research anywhere across the globe. For D News, I'm Courtney Thomas. And that's a wrap for this very special edition of D News. Now be sure to come visit the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University. It's a great place to discover. I'm Maria Papadakis, and thank you for watching. Funding for D News has been provided by the Cal and Lucille Rudman Institute for Entertainment Studies and the Antoinette Westfall College of Media Arts and Design. Special thanks to the Office of University Communications for their help in preparing this episode of D News. <laughs>